This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. Hi, I'm your inner dream monologue and you're fast asleep, so I'll be quick. Great job using the Colgate Optic White Overnight Teeth Whitening Pen before bed. When used as directed, it gives you a visibly whiter smile in just seven days. So while I fly and talk to animals, you're removing teeth stains with ease. Sweet dreams. And when you wake up, keep on living life to the brightest. Colgate Optic White. Find it at all major retailers. All right, Matt, we have an exciting return guest joining us uh, to, yeah. to break in to the soundtrack to UHF. Guys, I hope that last week's episode was entertaining and turned out all right. Uh, as you heard, there was, <laughs> you know, my computer exploded essentially in the last five wow. minutes of it. But that's we're part back. of the fun, though. I mean, that's very in the spirit of UHF, right? Yes, it was exactly. It, it, yeah. was, it, it was a gorilla a operation. Piece. We yeah. were doing the best we could. Yeah, On there'd, a there'd be a lot more here. Some beeps and bonks and and smoke and stuff. It was in UHF. Exactly. Yeah, it's very yeah, much yeah, in yeah. the spirit. Lovely. And that voice you might recognize as belonging to someone who did an Al TV with us. But here he is now to analyze a song. Patrick McDonald. Hi guys. Hey buddy. I'm here. <laughs> I got so excited. I didn't even wait for my last name. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> this, is a, this is a big one. I think when we did LTV, what's what's the difference? What what's what have you guys learned, and how has it grown since I've been here? Um, well, I want to get a quick report between LTV. Great and question. Now. Well, I wow. think the biggest report would be like fucking Paul Shear and Ali Gertz did our show, which is unbelievable. Wow, to us. I like, love them both. That's amazing. That was that was two really crazy gets. Incredible. We've seen yeah. Al's career completely catch on fire and stumble at Polka Party, and then he rebuilt yes. it from the ground to make what I think at this point we both agree is the best album of his career so far, which was even worse. Uh, riding the high of even worse, he gets a movie... And that movie gets a soundtrack, and that soundtrack causes a lot. That movie and that soundtrack causes a lot of damage for Al. Um, so, <laughs> at the time, at the wow. time that this was released, the movie does bad. The lead okay. single does not chart whatsoever. It actually ends his relationship with Rick Derringer. <laughs> Uh, this is the last production wow. Rick Derringer does. The note that it said on Wikipedia was, the producer and musician eventually parted ways because Derringer found Yankovic would not listen to any of his input, while Yankovic came to realize that he could do most of the production work himself. Uh, all studio <laughs> albums after would be produced by Yankovic. So yeah, this ends that. This was also uh, interesting to point out. The last Al release to be put out on vinyl until Alapalooza. Really? So all of 1989. I mean, this was we were we were phase, phasing out vinyl at this point. Yeah, it was starting we're to end. CDs. Yeah. And yeah, I remember exactly. the, the Al CDs. The, he was big on the CD. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yes. And the vinyl brand. never came back again. Um, so mm. <laughs> just <laughs> just throwing that out there for everybody who's so convinced all physical media will die. Uh, (laughs) but here we are, we're talking about money for nothing slash Beverly Hills, a title that I can't even wait to discuss. I was going to say, we actually have to, before we do anything else, the title of this song (laughs) is money for nothing forward slash Beverly Hillbillies asterisk. (laughs) That's the name of this song officially everywhere it appears. And it's something that Al... (laughs) hates he hates oh everything my god about can you imagine this is insane it looks it's like what you title the file on your computer when you're like trying to figure out what to do with it later 
Yeah, so, it truly. I mean, well, but also, "Money for Nothing" is the name of the real song. Well, so, and that yeah. Was, <laughs> so that was because I'm not sure if you know about this, but the the group Dire Straits put so many hurdles in front of Al in order for this to happen. First and foremost, they had to perform their own parts. So Jim West's hard work to learn this song just goes immediately out the window because it's the the guitarist and songwriter of Dire Straits is playing his own guitar riff. Mark no Knopfler is way. playing the guitar and Guy Fletcher from Dire Straits is playing the keys. Yes. Wow. So they were like, we will be doing this. Yeah, we will yeah. be doing this. And then <laughs> the fractured title, the title that we're talking about is a result of Dire Straits lawyer who insisted that money for nothing must remain in the title of the parody, uh, Yankovic was unhappy with the title and stated that he would have rather titled it Money for Nothing for the Beverly Hillbillies or Beverly Hillbillies for Nothing. But the legal title would also feature the asterisk next to Hillbillies, although is often printed without the marking. Um, just craziness. Also, the song is fully credited to Mark and Sting the original writers of Money for Nothing, and Paul yep. Henning, who wrote the theme song for the Beverly Hillbillies. So I think Al gets almost zero credit across the board on this movie, wow. or on this well, song. So Sting Sting gets a writing credit on this? Oh, this is a delightful tip. Sting gets okay. a writing credit on this because, uh, and Matt, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong in this this urban legend, but the story that I heard was that the police we're recording in the same general vicinity, like in the same recording area yeah. where Dire Straits was recording. And they approached Sting with the song and said, would you like to lay down a vocal for this? So Sting sang the uh, I want my, I want my, I want my MTV. But Sting did something very, very smart <laughs> was that he sang it specifically to the tune of his song, Don't Stand So Close to Me. So that they could wow. only use it if they also put Sting as a writer because they were using part of a police song now in Money for Nothing. That is the Holy official shit. story that is out in the world <laughs> well, of this song. And, and what I know, I do know about that recording because that what that happened at Air Studios Montserrat, which is a it was a recording studio that George Martin from the Beatles created. Yep. Uh, uh, this island and then it, there was a volcano and you know the island disappeared it was all this stuff but that's where like i worked for margaritaville so that's where jimmy buffett recorded volcano and that's where dire straits went and the police went and that was like there was like, a crossover where sting was leaving and dire straits was still there and he hung around for the day and it clearly made a lot of very smart fiscal moves <laughs> while <laughs> hanging out on this island yeah. that's brilliant i didn't you know, know funny? i didn't yeah it just came up again recently i see you guys saw that clip going around talking about how uh, P. Diddy still has to pay Sting every day. This is the story that he has to pay five thousand dollars a day for uh, the "I'll Be Missing You" sample for yeah. the rest of his life. He says. For the rest of his life. Now that <laughs> is that's an exaggeration. That's not actually true. Okay. But I like right. the fact that I, I think someone admitted that publicly. I don't know if it was Sting or 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 P. Diddy, but it was. Uh, I think Sting uh, really enjoys. Feeling like he's very savvy business wise, <laughs> I can, and by every measure, he is very savvy business wise. But I yeah. like the fact that not only is he that way, but he's like, "Check me out, everybody! Yeah. Well, get a load of this." He he <laughs> brags he about does, it. Yeah, he does. Let me put energy. my own song into this other song. <laughs> that, I think that's the wildest thing is that so it's like amazing. it's not a thing where it's like if any one of us pulled either one of those moves. We would like maybe take it to the grave or like only our friends would know about it. Stings like Seriously. Yes. call a press conference. I need the world yeah. to know what oh I God. just did. Patrick, yeah. you called this out as one that you specifically wanted to talk about. So let's start there. Yeah. Why why this song? What about this one? Well, I was just a huge fan of UHF when I was a kid. I was looking actually, I have my like high school DVD collection in here, and I was mm. looking because I had UHF, because UHF came as one of those DVDs. I don't think this is the actual one, but I have one. It was it was a two-sided DVD that yes. was a nightmare for any kid with anxiety because it's what am I'm gonna scratch this. Like I don't know what to do with this DVD. <laughs> this is very cool. There's so many features on here, but I'm gonna ruin this. <laughs> There's no way for me not to. But I was really obsessed with it. And I, this song I remember being kind of like uh crazy for me because the in the movie they treat it like it's a big turning point for him. 
But there's no reason for it to be. <laughs> we, we literally last week just talked about this scene could completely not exist and not a second of the movie is changed Serves by its no own narrative function at all. <laughs> and it's kind of like the only full song he does in the whole yeah. movie, yes. right? Well, like, I'm yes. pretty sure they play the entirety of Let Me Be Your Hog. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. 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 But this is like the presentation of like, this is the no. music video. And Any? I was like, yeah. this is the promise that Weird Al was going to deliver. He was going to add songs into this movie. This is the mm -hmm. one he chose. It's about the Beverly Hillbillies, which probably, I'm wondering if there's any legal ramifications of that as well. I wonder if there's any license. Thing. I'm sure that well that's what I mean I think he has to pay all of the money from this to to the writer of that theme song as well it's it's so <laughs> crazy it's so strange because you're right the way it's presented in the movie he is supposed to wake up with a light bulb idea from yes. this dream but we don't get the light bulb idea for like 10 more minutes when he sees <laughs> Stanley on the TV at the bar like it is so right. inconsequential to anything <laughs> it doesn't it it really doesn't fit at all unless no. the only thing i can think of is maybe when they made this music video they're like man this is a really expensive video we should put it in the movie somewhere just yeah, to like maybe get, to reap some benefit. I was going to say that's something I couldn't figure out because in the anticipation of this episode, I was trying to figure out like what came first, right? Like, is yeah. did he have this already and was like, oh, I'm going to put this into the movie, or did he think I want to get a new single into the like? I, I don't know which like like how this was written in because either way. Right. It seems clunky. <laughs> but, and I'm so curious yeah. about all processes. It doesn't sound like he thinks about any sort of legal ramifications when he picks a song. It sounds like he's like, oh, this is a fun one. I'm going to go with it. Uh, yeah. And then I guess every single one. I mean, you guys are you're going to get to Amish Paradise in yeah. a, a few mm -hmm. months. But that's that's probably the whole a thing there. where He just like doesn't know what he's walking into every single no. time. Well, so something yeah. that I did not know until today that Money for Nothing was not the original song that he wanted to do this with. Hey, there we go. This is another case of Prince saying no. He wanted to do this with Let's Go Crazy by Prince. And and once again, Prince said, nah, I'm good. Wow. <laughs> Did he want to do like Beverly Hillbillies Let's Go I Crazy? I think that was, was the it? plan. I think it's a, So it says... <laughs> really? Wait a minute. No, wait. Really? He wanted to do... Why? It says Yankovic <laughs> reveals on the DVD commentary for UHF that the concept for Money Nothing slash Beverly Hills was originally a parody of Prince's Let's Go Crazy. However, Prince refused or was consistently unreceptive unre to any ideas from <laughs> Yankovic. <laughs> Like, wow. Oh, what I wouldn't give. I can't I can't even I wrap my head around what that would be. Yeah, I really, really want to know. I, I I'm maybe like it was, Googling if there's anything on here. That, maybe it was yeah. so maybe we're thinking about it. Maybe it was a different show. Right? Because think of the way that the verses are in Let's Go Crazy. Like the Beverly Hills Billies theme wouldn't work out, but I bet another TV show theme Al figured out fit right in with that dun 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 ba dun ba dun 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 yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> well yeah well, cause, and that that's getting to a larger point here which is that this is ostensibly this is the same thing he did several years ago on Brady Bunch right yes. where he takes mm. the uh, the music from the safety dance and basically just inserts the Brady Bunch theme song lyrics into that this yeah. by comparison is so much better yes it's and so much better done like because that was clunky and weird and it, it, it like listening to it i was like this is just like kind of trying to smush these two things together in a uh in a very like it works but it, it was like it doesn't feel natural it didn't this feels feel like it had a purpose natural. at all like it just yeah. felt yeah. like i i have to do a safety dance parody let's try this because it looks like it worked. like like there yeah. was no but this, like, the juxtaposition is so outrageous yeah, that, like, it works in a way. Like, I will say, I, I did, I think you're probably on the same AV Club article, but he literally says, I had a parody of Let's Go Crazy that was about the Beverly Hillbillies. Yeah. <laughs> My God, I am I'm shook, guys. I cannot believe I that. That was I'm the first idea. Took that the Beverly Hillbillies was the idea that <laughs> blows my mind that that was the non-negotiable that that's what he's taking from something and putting into something else look he probably sent Paul Henning already his check for $50 for the lyrics oh so he's God. like yeah he can't get it back back in the day you could get checks back like that um man yeah that that I 
it's so fascinating. I mean, I guess that's the beauty of Weird Al is that there's this kind of like arbitrariness to his art, yeah. right? Not yeah, to get yeah, like yeah. too deep in it, but it's like funny because it's frivolous. It's like I took this powerful thing that's really important and I made it about baloney or whatever. Like it's like he does that so well. So it's like it's to sit down and be like, well, why do you do this one? Probably it yeah. betrays what he's trying to do. <laughs> But I'm going to keep doing it because it blows me away. Yeah. I, just to settle on Beverly Hillbillies is, is so funny to me. There's something um, – uh, some previous guest mentioned this, and I can't remember who it was. It might have actually been Brendan, but pointed out that like uh, – from Wheatus, uh pointed out that Al has qualities that are almost like, like Andy Warhol. Right. Like the idea of like, we're going to it's just about pop culture and we're going to take these two pop culture ideas and we're going to smash them together in a way to make something else. And they don't belong together other than the fact that it's just still all about pop culture as a whole being the piece and right. society being the art of, of all of it. And that's like. Again, a very uh, big, grandiose way to describe this very silly parody. Well, but I really no, think it's I like true. That. I really think that's what it is. Like that's like that's what makes this yeah. so. You know, it's like uh, it's like you know fusion cooking or something like yeah, that. Like right. you just find like yourself the, with this yeah. thing that these two things shouldn't go together, and because they shouldn't, it's oddly satisfying. It's <laughs> right, like the distillation of intake in a day. If you turn exactly. on the radio, then you watch TV, and it's like you're putting it all together. It's, totally, yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. It, so I, I recently did a tour of this this manor that's right by uh, Sleepy Hollow in New York. They were talking about how inside that manor, everything looks like it's built out of marble and pine and all this stuff. But every element of the house is faux because at the time that the house was built, it was more expensive to have a fake version of something than to get the real thing. And you wanted to show off how much money you had. By going wow. and being like, oh yeah, no, we wouldn't, we wouldn't dare import regular marble. Uh, we're gonna make faux marble. My point of that story being that I'm wondering if Al is on cloud nine so much that he's like, fuck it, I'll pay the money to Dire Straits and the Beverly Hillbillies just because I fucking can. I'd like, <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> like, like I'm just imagining, I'm gonna and I think stunts. it's funny in my head because Al is so not this person, but like Al at that like Jim Morrison, like I'm a golden God level where he's just mm -hmm. like, like I'm weird fucking Al Yankovic. I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's what I want to believe. I just, believe this this yeah. was his Scarface moment. Absolutely. Yeah, just like just out, absolutely outrageous. Mind. And then it humbled him. Like it brought him, yeah. it brought him back We're too close to the earth. sun, clearly. <laughs> yeah. So there's one note about the actual video that I think is extremely important for all of us. Do you know who designed the animated characters that we see in this video? Like who is the person who was brought in to design the Owl and Judd uh, animated characters? No. I don't know that. David Silverman, who is like essentially the co-creator of The Simpsons with Matt Groening. Like he started there. He started with Matt Groening at Tracy Ullman and is like, is described as the man who created the rules on how the Simpsons need it to look wow. uh, so much so that he's the person who got to direct the Simpsons movie that came out in wow. 2007. No kidding. But his, no, wait. his Whoa. humble beginnings were animating a, a <laughs> Al Yankovic di dire straits uh, mashup character. For so no, wow. wait, he didn't, he didn't do the, uh, the dire straits one. He just did the parody. He just did the parody one for UHF. Wow. Because it's, I, I was gonna say, I, I would have not been surprised if it was the same person who did them both, because they really look oh, yeah. like, in terms of a video lookalike, they really did an incredible job of matching they're, the uh, the look of that Dire Straits video. Yeah, there. I was, I mean, just to speak on the video, there are no. Uh, it's such a one to one uh, like parody. It almost feels like a, a just an exact homage to it, or just like a recreation, and then with clips of the Beverly Hillbillies. Together. I was gonna say, there's no yeah. jokes in it. Yeah, there's no jokes. I was gonna say it's actually like, <laughs> and not to be too mean, it's almost kind of boring because it yeah. is just like a straight. <laughs> exact copy right. all the way down to the band like the drum fill the uh jumping off the stage like the platform everything is just exactly the same exactly. and uh yeah other than inserting <laughs> some beverly hillbillies footage it's just right. the same video uh right which is it's just it's also why you're watching it in the vid in the movie and you're like what's the joke here yeah like there that's the other thing where you're like there's nothing there what's happening like it's yeah. truly like 
it, it is this this really just just kind of brings a lot of ennui in me, a lot of existentialism. I'm like, what's yeah, the absolutely. Point? absolutely. And I just want to yeah. confirm, I checked, I had to check David Silverman's IMDb credits, but yes, it is only this. <laughs> Like, wow. like it's not that he's tied to the Dire Straits one at any point. He also was the animator for a Tom Waits video called Tom Waits for No One. And <laughs> he really good. God. and he also animated. If you've ever seen it was kind of a box office bomb along with UHF. One Crazy Summer um, oh, where John that. Cusack is a cartoonist. He did all of the animation for what John Cusack's character is uh, drawing. Uh, which makes sense because oh, wow. along with The Simpsons, he was tied to Eek the Cat. Eek the Cat was created by the director of uh, One Crazy Summer, who also did like Better Off Dead, which is probably the most well-known. Right, and he did, right, right. Sorry, we're going down a giant spiral about Dave no, Silverman on our I, podcast. I, that's, but. Cool. Th- that's a that's a really amazing uh, little piece of trivia that he he worked on this. That's crazy. And then obviously one day we'll get to the Simpsons episode where Al shows up as his, as himself say. to do the Jack and Diane parody. So that's right, wow. Patrick. I was thinking about this also. Nothing to do with this. How is it possible that in this long career of Al, we will never be able to invite you on for a Jimmy Buffett parody? Because somehow, despite the massive cult popularity of Jimmy Buffett, I don't think he's ever once even dabbled in a Buffett style parody or anything. I know. I've never seen it. It's funny because it's it's I, I yeah, it's it's stunning. I don't know what he would he he could knock Margaritaville out of the park. He could or do just a any of in paradise. Yeah, but imagine I him taking his demented, close. dark sense of humor to the easy, laid-back style that is every Jimmy Buffett song. It's like it I don't understand great. how it didn't happen. <laughs> I know it's it, it's a huge bummer. I I I wonder I wonder why I wonder if because Jimmy's always been very lighthearted and and has jokes and is very funny. So I wonder if it's too close to oh like a hat like, on a hat what type situation. Allardy does yeah, That's yeah. So exactly what like, I was gonna say yeah. I, I remember yeah. we talked about this last time you were on is that Jimmy Buffett oh, yeah. has such a sense of humor in what he yeah. does. And maybe for Al, parodying someone with a sense of humor is just less fun. Yeah, that's why he keeps yeah. asking Prince. Exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> he wants to get people like against their will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Anyone who's like exactly. too eager, it's not yeah. uh, it's not as good. I feel like Al's in the best position of his life because now like even in the 80s and 90s there could be a certain vein of like people being like yeah you don't don't let Al Yankovic parody your song could you imagine any artist in 2023 saying no to Al how badly no. the internet would turn on that that particular person at this point well again to jump ahead a significant amount, the last time we saw it, and it might be the last time it ever happens was with Lady Gaga yeah and it was Ooh, a yeah. swift response where people were just like how dare you and she had to come out and be like it wasn't me it was my manager and honestly i don't know if that's true or not but it's a great <laughs> right. it's a great answer when you've yeah, made a mistake it blame it on this person who no one's ever going to see <laughs> uh and it worked out like you know she wound up like course correcting and it was fine but yeah, yeah no that was the last time i saw it and i remember the reaction was crazy yeah. people were really so upset wild. with her yeah i mean I, it's funny too because when you think about like who al's gonna hit next he can obviously hit popular music but you never know if he'll throw a, like a 40 year old parody in or something he like does that. every once in a while I like to go back and, and I do love something that old too. like that yeah totally. so maybe he'll hit a margaritaville or maybe he'll hit a yeah. son of a son of a sailor or something like that there you we go. gotta we gotta see if it hits that would be very exciting i uh, i just or I, i'd see them collaborate or something anything yeah. i mean look if he's good enough to collaborate with Alan Jackson. <laughs> yes, exactly. Why not Al? Well, because <laughs> similar vibe, but like the horror podcast that I do, we recently recorded an episode on Club Dread. And like the story yeah. behind that is like when they sent him the Coconut Pete songs, he was like, I want to play these live. Like, like yes. he was yeah. like, so he thought it was so funny. He wanted to yeah. do all of those songs. Yeah. Then absolutely he nobody saw Club Dread, and he was like, "Well, never mind." But, yeah. <laughs> right. but at a certain point, no, he wanted to play like Pina Coladaville at live oh, yeah. shows. Like, I wish he did. I uh, yeah. I, uh, I and then they got the Hawaiian shirt connection. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot to it. I wonder if there has been a. Let me. I don't, let yeah. Me see, see if they've ever that. even been photographed together. Maybe they're yeah. the same person. Well, why? Yeah. Why <laughs> you do that? I <laughs> While you do that, I just want to point out in terms of the older things, like this was a couple years, like uh, Money for Nothing came out in 85. Yeah. And this comes out, it gets recorded in 88, but comes out in 89. So that is a few years for Al. You know, again, things moved a lot slower back then. It's not like a yeah. old, old song. But at this point, at the time he records the parody, it is 
for sure successful. Which is also like, yeah. weirdly, 85 yeah. is still newer than Let's Go Crazy would have been. Because Let's true. Go Crazy true, was true, 84, true. I think. And again, maybe in the name of, now we're starting to get to the bottom of it a little bit more, maybe in the name of putting something in his film, yeah. maybe it was like, well, I can't take a, sh- a risk that yeah, I'm going right. to do a parody of a song that will flop. Because yeah. then I have a parody of a flop in the middle of my movie. <laughs> yeah. And that's just going to age it poorly before it even comes out. Yeah. Right. So and this had to be a yeah. sure thing. You'd have to have a good song in the middle of it that'll be like, oh, that's the one. Yeah. I mean, but that's the exactly. whole question of when I first saw UHF, I was so excited because I was a kid who was obsessed with the the food album. And then I found uh, UHF and I was like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be my favorite movie. And I remember watching it on like a little portable TV, like in a car or something like that, driving mm. somewhere. Um, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't like a flip up. It was like a TV with a VHS base on the bottom. That oh, I love those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out. They're the best. And I remember being like, where's the music? <laughs> because <laughs> I'm like, I know. I love the music. I love the parodies. He like clearly is parodying movies in that show. But it's like, yeah, or in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's the only song you get. And you're like, it's so baffling. But it, yeah, Al has that weird prism where you can like wonder if what he's doing is like a fuck you, like a joke or like a, a, he, like you can never he, he can claim that everything he does is not a mistake because it's like a commentary or a parody or a subversion well, of something. That's totally. the thing that we've definitely noticed doing because you did the very first Al TV with us. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure. I yeah, mean, I in so. the later Al TVs. I feel like we've kind of concluded that part of him doing Al TV really turned into like him getting back at anybody who who like declined a parody or like <laughs> see like there are so many things where you're like man he seems to be really going at this particular celebrity for some reason right and then you do like a little bit of research and it's like oh okay that around this time he asked so and so about a parody and they said no and then now it's like every Al music news. It's like a punchline tied to that particular person right, where yeah. it's like there, I don't want to say that Al is ever mean cause he's not, but there definitely seems to be a little bit of, at least in the eighties, like how dare you <laughs> type right. attitude. Like, a little he's not like man. mean, mean, but he's pointed. Yeah. He can certainly, uh, he can certainly, uh, uh, hone poke in fun. on a person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. exactly. To find that, find that moment. Yeah, did you guys it's, it's uh, not to, sorry to, something no, ahead, of a hard segue ahead. but uh, uh, did you guys notice listening to this did you do a comparison of the two like I listened to Dire Straits Money for Nothing and then I listened to his his version and it's extra interesting to know that Mark Knopfler played on both of them Al's version is oddly like better so let me tell so I've got a note <laughs> for you on that my friend I knew you would Matt so, so <laughs> according to Yankovic his guitarist, Jim West, had practiced the song for weeks and as a result could recreate the original. However, Mark has been playing the song for years and as a result was much more relaxed in his performance. Al swears that West's version sounds closer to the recorded version than what you Makes get in the sense. song. Makes total sense. Because <laughs> like, it, it's wow. a thing you do as a musician. You play a song, like you record it, but then after you record it, you tour it. And like he's playing that song every night. For years, we just established it's been like four, th- four or five years, or three or four years. Um, so yeah, he has gotten better at it. Yeah. Uh, Mark Knopfler has gotten better at playing the part, <laughs> and so now inadvertently jokes on you, Mark Knopfler. You wanted to play it again. Now Al's version sounds better than yours. That's so you funny. goofed. I, I really thought listening to it, I was like, this is crazy. Like it actually, it's like a yeah. better recording. Yeah. I really think it is. I'm not like, uh, no, uh, obviously I'm a huge Al fan, but seriously, I was like, wow, this is like a better track. Yeah. It feels than the, cleaner. Than the it definitely Straits feels one, like, right? yeah, yeah. Like I, smoother. Yeah, totally. I yeah. think the word that Al used relaxed is like exactly. Relaxed is it. good. Like it feels like he's just effortlessly playing this riff that I think is still like widely considered one of the 10 greatest guitar riffs that's like ever been recorded. It is. Right. And it is known for being exceptionally difficult because it's a finger picking part. Like you can't yeah. play that with a pick. You have to use your, it's a, it's a like almost like a classical style picking part. Um, so a lot of guitarists, a lot of rock guitarists never even learn to play that way. So it's a very uh, advanced uh, thing to do. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, uh, I'm just, I love the fact that, he came on and did it and did it like not wrong, but like not the way Al wanted <laughs> yeah. it. And he just had to go with it anyway. It was like something about that just cracks me up. It's hilarious. I, I do think that there's an element that you find in music too. And I, and I'm curious 
because Matt's really the only real musician, like true, true to form musician on this chat. I've picked up an acoustic guitar a few times, uh, but like <laughs> you do hear these stories of like artists at a certain point. Beatles are like a beautiful example of this, right? Where it's like you get so sucked into the production and like mm-hmm. what the song sounds like and like layering all this different stuff and building and building and building. And then, you know, those artists ultimately get disappointed that people wish that it sounded like the band that they loved. And Matt, you and I have had these conversations before of like, I would way rather an artist I love take a giant swing and miss than just put out the same album 15 times or whatever. But I think that it's not even, I don't want to hear Green Day play Dookie for 14 different albums, but I do want green day to always maintain that raw energetic like that that thing that you can't ever recapture which is like 17 year olds being given an opportunity who don't know any better so they're just going into it raw it's the same thing with what makes the first wu-tang clan album is so good and they could never replicate it again because like they didn't know any better about how to keep the beats on time or anything. And it creates this weird rawness where it doesn't sound like it's in a studio at all. It sounds like they just have the turntables there and they're just going. Yeah. And like, yeah. and once I mean, you get the production involved, it falls apart. And I think the original money for nothing has that rawness to it that this lacks. Here's the thing that is, and this is not a universal truth, but people don't really realize some like hearing someone be really, really good at something can just be boring. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's not, it's right. uh, it's the reason why, like, the, the greatest, fastest guitar players in the world are not usually headlining enormous stadiums. They're playing at Guitar Center yeah. up the street <laughs> for no one. I mean, yeah. it, it's really not, it has to be so much more than that. And hearing someone who's technically great play technically great can be fun for a moment, but it's not special. It's not exciting in the way that hearing someone like learning how to make something is, yeah. as you just described, Matt. And we've said it before on the show. I think it's so true. A part of Al's secret to longevity and success is that the nature of what he does allows him to never get too comfortable. Yes. He's right. always pushing himself into a new territory. He can always like parody something that he doesn't maybe understand a genre that he has not touched before. And he and his band get to like do a deep dive and learn how to do something they haven't done. Well, I think, and that's so many artists will never do that. And they'll just wind up playing the same type of thing their whole career. And after 20, 30 years, like how in the world can you be expected to keep finding new uh, terrain to discover in that? It's also, I think what makes when he, even outside of music, you know what I mean? Like when he shows up in say a funnier die sketch, there is something that's charming about it because it's like he's not a great actor, <laughs> like, right. but he's but got those eyes and that voice, yeah, you're like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, like you're just like, hey, he's going wrong. for it, he's doing his thing, yeah. like like it's like, but it is, it's it's something that's charming because it's almost like you're watching people who've been doing say improv for years, but they're joined by like one person who just finished their first year at Groundlings, <laughs> and, right. and they go, they have a ba- they have a basic like a baseline understanding of the rules and like how to do a yes end, but they're yeah. not like on that same level, but like, it's fun to watch Al even play in those types of absolutely worlds, which I think is why everybody wants to work with him in some way. If they're absolutely. even remotely tied to music or comedy, they want to find a way to work with Al right. because he seems like as, as big of a celebrity as he is. And I'm not saying this to shoot ourselves in the foot. I, I, I really, truly believe that it's not a question of will we ever get Al Yankovic on weird algorithm, but like (laughs) when, and that's, and I'm only saying that because he seems like that person that like, he does want to play in the sandbox. He's not that person who's like, oh, I'm only going to play in the sandbox if it's a person of like this caliber. It's like, if you're passionate enough and good enough at whatever it is that you're doing and he can tell that it's something that he'll have fun doing, then he's he'll do it. Like, I think Allie was oh, the one totally. that was like, I don't know. We did my Simpsons podcast. Why wouldn't he do your podcast? <laughs> like, <laughs> he totally will. He totally will. I mean, we had a, we had a thing with like, you know, I, with my little experience with Jimmy Buffett, it's like, 
we hosted a podcast about Jim Buffett for like eight years. And then Radio Margaritaville found us and was like, do you want to be DJs on our station? And then we became DJs on the station We're doing that for two years. And then they had us now we're interviewing people and like for the official podcast for them. So I just interviewed like John Oates and Graham Nash and we interview all it's these amazing. Cool people. It's been amazing, but it's, it's cool because you just have to, especially for this and we're kind of talking about the podcast now, but it's yeah. like <laughs> you have to keep doing it. And then once you do it, people know you and then, you just it just happens. It just it's absolutely. Just that, it's a very much a version of manifesting. That yeah, just I think our like, thing I'm is like we consistent, can, intentional. Consistent, we physically totally. could not release that episode until we were done the entire project because right. it would <laughs> right. It would literally you be the end of the yeah. show. <laughs> right. True. It's very yeah, true. Yeah, absolutely. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. I'm your inner dream monologue, and you're fast asleep, so I'll be quick. Great job using the Colgate Optic White Overnight Teeth Whitening Pen before bed. When used as directed, it gives you a visibly whiter smile in just seven days. So while I fly and talk to animals, you're removing teeth stains with ease. Sweet dreams. And when you wake up, keep on living life to the brightest. Colgate Optic White. Find it at all major retailers. 91 Donkey Lane is a magical apartment complex that contains immense power, but lacks intelligent inhabitants. What is happening? I'm getting texts. Why are we getting a lot of texts? People found out what we did. Oh, dividing Mike Myers into an infinite amount of tiny Mike Myers. Listen to 91 Donkey Lane for free on Spotify or your favorite podcasting app. More at 91donkeylane.com. See you there, you donkeys. I wanted to ask us about, because we were kind of going in about like musicians and, and the roughness making them the, per, the personality of the, of the song and stuff like that. And yeah. it made me think about how a lot of that, the imperfections of a lot of musicians. One thing I love about Jimmy Buffett is a lot of his live albums. He has a 1979 live album that's like crazy like yeah. he i don't know what happened they i'm sure i can think of a couple of things they might have done before the concert in 1979 <laughs> but they just the whole band is like alive and it's like what is it's called you had to be there and it's mm. like a crazy album um but there's little moments where he kind of shows through his career uh these feelings you know you just get to know him as a person and a genuine person and he tells jokes and he's funny but he was big on stage we al kind of never uh, is himself right or him it's like a heightened version of himself but you never saw him be himself almost anywhere so where do you think the connection is coming for fans to artists where you feel like you know al like where is it in the we have similar sense of humors like he it's it's a concocted thing so i'm curious where you guys yeah. think that that's a good from. question i like that actually i i i do personally think that it's a combination of his sense of humor and his musical taste yeah yeah where it's that like it, it hits a mark and thought of yeah because we've said before on this show and we're gonna start to get to these records very soon we're like the records that i grew up listening to like i heard al before i heard a lot of the artists that he parodied yeah and then i took right. a break from al kind of and i got into other music and then i like got older and then i looked back and i was like wait a minute all of the things I like are things that Al parodied <laughs> that well, I heard as a kid. And it was like, did he just incepted all these ideas in my brain? Yeah. Um, but that's a part of what made it resonate is like he, he has these musical, his, his musical taste is great and his sense of humor is oddball and twisted enough that it really works for well, me. Your friend Phil, I think said it best on this show of everybody when he came on to talk about you make me. And he was saying like, you know, as any young boy, he got into Weird Al and it was mm -hmm. like great. And then he was like, well, now I'm going to like serious music. So he's like, you throw out your Weird Al Yankovic records and you buy like Nirvana or, or Foo Fighters or like whatever, like the big famous serious band is. He's like, but if you become like a diehard music fan, you keep escalating and then you start to get into like the really weird nooks and crannies and when you get into those nooks and crannies where you eventually do end up listening to an oingo boingo or a b52s or a devo or like 
these bands that for someone on the outside who doesn't dive deeper, yeah. they seem like a goofy, frivolous group. But like you listen to it and you're like, these are some of the most impressive, smart musicians I've ever heard. And then you mm-hmm. realize, oh, every song that I thought was an Al Yankovic original was him pulling these specific artists' sounds and styles because this is what he liked. You realize like, right. oh, he's a very smart music fan. Like yeah. he's yeah. he's not really listening. I I'm willing to bet that Al knows mainstream music as much as he needs to for his general career and vibe. But I don't think that he's buying the albums of a top forty artist. I think he's still right. like into what's the the underground indie stuff that he wishes was more popular so that he could do parodies of it. He has yeah, the taste totally. of like. Uh, of an indie record shop employee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, like he, he's definitely like, that's, that seems to be his vibe. Yeah. And that's not even counting the comedy side, which is also very left of center and not right. non-traditional comedy. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I get to, I totally agree, Matt and Phil will love hearing that you uh, complimented him so highly there. Well, he had the audacity to stand me up at one of those weedish shows. I, I know. I well, you know him, what? So. B- believe me, we are fighting big time over that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a- another just point in terms of Al's, like cleverness, like a thing in this song. And it's kind of what blows my mind about the idea that he wanted to do Let's Go Crazy first is that there is really something here that is fascinating with the lyrical connection between Money for Nothing and this show about the Beverly Hillbillies coming from the lottery or no, who I'm sorry, who finds black gold or Texas tea and uh, move to California. And the idea of like the working class entering the upper class or this like the juxtaposition of this it actually like there's a lyrical connective tissue here that is really interesting so the idea that money for nothing was the second choice is just even stranger to me Mm -hmm. like i can't understand how that's possible it's crazy i'm still thinking too well yeah i mean and also just breaking it down even more is the fact that the joke is not on the on the title of the song, right? None. Of, it's like it's 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 like yeah. It's just it's it, it, he very rarely seems to do that. Where it's like it's yeah. on the down rhythm of the. It's like on the and the chicks for free. Like yeah. the song would is called and the chicks for free. Which exactly. I, and I've also yeah, been sitting yeah. here trying to analyze what he would have done on that print song. And I think I, it, I maybe would be Jed goes crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I would guess. Maybe, but then he would have not, he would have not used the original lyric. It would have just been about the Beverly Hillbillies. But exactly. in that context, yeah, again, I, I don't, man, add it to the long list of questions we have for Al when he finally comes on this show. But, um, I, cause I'm, I'm so fascinated yeah. Al, by it. But I yeah, need the, you to perform for us <laughs> how this let's go crazy Beverly Hillbillies thing would even yeah, work because exactly. our brains are broken. Oh my God. Um, yeah, but it, yeah, it's, it's so clever. <laughs> the idea that it was the second choice. It just, it, yeah. it blows my mind. It blows my mind. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It's really, yeah. really, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just, I'm just looking at all the lyrics too. It's just like, a, yeah, I, I think California, California, Cal, yeah. It's just really, really funny. I don't it's know. It's also I have to point out because the original, the Dire Straits song, and I under, it is done as satire, and the whole thing is from the perspective of a person who we're not supposed to like. But the original right. Dire Straits song uses a word that I'm not going to repeat on this show. <laughs> that Al rhymes with it starts with f and al rhymes with clamp it (laughs) and it's one of the only lines that al inserts that is not a lyric from or that's not a line from the beverly hillbillies theme yeah he he wrote that line in to fit the dire straits thing it is so brilliant guys like that is that is yeah that little clamp it is a millionaire is such a good lyric (laughs) oh my god that little clamp it got his own cement pond that little clamp it he's a millionaire (laughs) i mean the the little things that he added he he manages to fit the beverly hillbillies lines into the form of this song almost exactly and then adds just little moments to fill it in with stuff like that that only elevates it so much higher I want to I want to mention to the hills that is which is such a to me as a writer it's it's the it's the most desperate thing you could do. He clearly couldn't make it work <laughs> and he had to add like spoken text to this song yeah. that doesn't exist. Um but now knowing I mean it just feels like it's this is like the end of a CSI episode. It feels like it's all connecting for me that the, he had to like ham fist this, <laughs> uh this 
subject matter into this song. Yeah, because um, that's not. Uh, that's definitely not a thing. There's not a point in Money for Nothing where <laughs> where he's just like, yeah. bah, da, da. Like, no, yeah, the like, only the only one that he free. does sort of girls yeah. that is. Like, I, don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what that would be. <laughs> That's what great. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the only thing like that in the original that he did keep is the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in Money for Nothing, they, out of nowhere, he says the line, Hoover Mover, yeah. <laughs> which is like a Hoover, like a vacuum, yeah. Hoover Mover, and Al does Mover Mover movie stars, like, and has to extend it yet good. again to get his joke to land, but still. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's, I feel like it's rare that I can think of a song where he, like, he takes... Because he's, again, combining two things. So it's not just one song he's parodying. It's two. Right. right. But he's taken just the right amount of liberty with yeah. all of it to make it work and to make it feel like... I, I've been wanting to check, Matt, because you pointed out how like he has to share the writing credit on this song with so many people. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really hope... Uh, on Wikipedia, he is still credited as a writer. I, I will be really sad if he didn't get writing credit for this, because the amount of work he did put in to getting this to work the way that it is, he deserves more credit than Sting. Yes. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> if, if Sting got writing credit on this song and Al did not, I am withdrawing all the nice things I said about Velvet Elvis. <laughs> um, well, I, right, think, I think we've gotten to that point where it's time to start doing some rankings, uh, which is always, it always feels like I'm getting my sea legs back after we do like a block of like TV episode stuff. Where I'm like, oh yeah, we got to rank this stuff next. Yeah, we haven't done one in a while. Uh, I, get, I guess, Matt, really quick before we do, because um, we usually do this on and stuff like this, and this is our only opportunity. Do we have any particular overall thoughts on Dire Straits as a band? I really like Dire Straits. You really uh, like Dire Straits. I, I've, I mean, I'm not like a diehard fan that has any of their albums, but every time I hear a Dire Straits song, I really like it. I think Money for Nothing is brilliant. I think that Romeo and Juliet is one of the prettiest love songs that has ever been written, and uh, I also can't separate that song from when it's used in Empire Records. There you go. And you'll notice that I've been doing this brilliant thing where I refuse to say his last name because I know I will not pronounce it properly, but the uh, main guy from Dire Straits... Mark Knopfler. There we go. Uh, <laughs> also composed what I think is one of the prettiest pieces of musical score because he did the Princess Bride music. And the, oh, that's um, right, he did. I forgot about that. And that little guitar that. riff that he came up with for that, I think, is just like weirdly a piece of instrumental music that just feels romantic. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah. so, I think that they're very, cool. they're a very talented group. I think he's a very talented guitarist. I mean, that's not a hot take. I think any guitar magazine yeah. would back that up. But, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah I'm a fan. Is, yeah. I was going to say, there's a documentary called Under the Volcano about that recording studio. That's mm -hmm. really cool. It's kind of a smaller documentary, but it's it's cool because Dire Straits is in a lot of it. And, and they talk a lot about how being in Montserrat on that island um, influenced a lot of their album, that, that album that they recorded there. Uh, and that's where this song came from. That's where Walk of Life came from, which is literally written about a, a, a surf teacher that was mm -hmm. like, on the island and had this like little dance that he used to do, and they loved it, and they wrote a song like basically to the rhythm of the dance he did. Uh, and then, uh, but it's it's really cool. So I was gonna say that too. I'm I'm, I'm a fan of Dire Straits and like it's it's hits. And then I like Brothers in Arms in the in the infamous West Wing episode. Yeah, um, which right. is like a great song. And then Walk of Life, I love. Patrick, and I've got a life, dumb yeah. question that the answer is probably just like no, but <laughs> you know a lot about this Volcano record studio. I know yes. that Jimmy Buffett has a song, an album called Volcano. Did he happen to record that album at this Volcano record studio? He certainly did, yeah. He recorded <laughs> it there. Can you believe it or not? Uh, he was literally looking up at the volcano, and I was like, I wonder when that's going to blow. Yeah. I don't know. And yeah. then they wrote it. And that was the whole <laughs> name of the that album. That song is so yeah. fucking good, too. That song is that, so much better than it has great. any right to be for a song that has approximately 10 lyrics. <laughs> we, we, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we call that his, um, uh, his We Didn't Start the Fire, because at the very end, in live, concerts he always goes like don't want to go to no uh, san juan airport don't want to go to no tennessee whatever he like has all these places that he usually says <laughs> in the last one 
he he adds something that's in the current events. So he for a while it was like don't want to go to Mar-a-Lago or whatever it was. <laughs> on the screen. So there's always like a new one that he adds. So everyone every time Volcano comes on in the concert, you're like, what's he gonna add? What's his current event <laughs> that Jimmy wants to reference? So yeah, he certainly did it there. I, I also, love that in uh, a certain way that's yeah. about as political as Jimmy Buffett gets it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. He, he throws it in. Doesn't want to go to Mar-a-Lago, and we'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, there you uh, go. <laughs> uh, I, I was also gonna say that that documentary is great because it has a lot of those like biopic music moments because Elton John recorded one of his albums down on that uh, recording studio in Montserrat. And I guess there was mm. a part where they were all tired because they all got sick from the food or they were been drinking too much. And then they were like, everyone's going home. Like everyone's sick. And then the engineer says, I'm still standing. And guess what? Boom. <laughs> That's where they came up with still standing. I it is it. so I funny it. how many songs come from the absolute <laughs> dumbest <laughs> origin. I know, right? It's, so it's crazy. <laughs> It's like so some good. of them you're like that can't possibly be true and then it's like the artist's like yep that's basically all that happened <laughs> yeah it's my absolute how about you Matt what are, what are your dire straits takes <laughs> oh um I I like them I prefer their records that are a little earlier than this to be honest like this album which Brothers in Arms is the record this is on and it is often on like the best albums of all time list I, I found like uh, to me, I once like listened to this album, like start to finish. And I found it very challenging to get through. <laughs> there were certain songs. It's really long. The thing I was building to is, OK, the original version of Money for Nothing it's that's like on the record is like nine minutes long. <laughs> Guys, it's way too long. <laughs> Dire Straits for the single. Cut it down. It's way too long. Dire Straits cut it down wow. for the single to like four. Yeah. And Al cut it to 308. God bless you, Al. That's Wait, the right length as far as Al I'm concerned. It, I have to double work. check this real quick. Did Al, I wonder if this was intentional. Al's is the shortest, I think, of all of them. Well, no, 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 obviously. Mm. But yeah. did he cut it down to the exact length that Billy Joel says a song will be cut down to in The Entertainer? 305, I think Oh, uh, 305, that. so close. I think this is 308. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to have, have a here. hit, you yeah. got to make it fit, and they'll cut it down to 305. 305, yeah. Uh, nice try. That would have been so good if... <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's my only note. I would just like I I'm, I think Al's uh, editing choices on this song were very good. It's a great riff. I don't mind it running for a long time. Not nine minutes. It's too long, guys. Uh, <laughs> it's too long. That's insane. I challenge anyone to listen to the original Money for Nothing and just get have a great time the whole time. It's tough. <laughs> it's real tough. Challenge or punish? Yeah, that's too much. <laughs> Matt, where are you going to put this on your parodies list? Because I'm actually not sure where I want this to land just yet. I, I actually do know, so I'm going to say this is kind of fallen in the middle for me, and I do, I, I do really like. I want to drive home once again that there will be a little bit more of this coming up. But you know, we we talked about Brady Bunch. You had a way harder time with Brady Bunch than I did yeah. back in the day. But this is just better in 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 every way. Um, and I, I really think this is super clever. It's not like my all time favorite or anything, but it's going to go towards the high middle, I suppose. So I'm going to put it incredibly. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> I just have to say, cause, uh, for the listeners, Matt and I have a shared, uh, like board here where we keep all of our stats so we can keep track of it for ourselves. And Matt, I think just randomly put this in a spot. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Matt just like casually dropped it in the exact spot I was going to say, which is uh, it's going to be right in between addicted to spuds and alimony. I can't believe you did that, Matt. I I was about to say it. And then I looked at the sheet. I was like, wait, what am I tripping? Did I already do this? Have we gone back in time? Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. I just was like, well, I know it's not going to be at the bottom. So let me just drop it somewhere and then I'll move it. You nailed it. You nailed it. I don't even Um, need to rank him anymore. Matt can do my rankings for me. (laughs) Uh, I'm going to be kind of in the similar vein. Um, yeah. Mine is definitely above alimony and below uh, addicted to spuds as well, but there's a little bit more in the middle there. Mm. Um, I'm going to plop this between the theme of Rocky 13, Ryer the Kaiser, and My Bologna. Um, I think that the recording of this is just not, and that's not a diss to the song My Bologna, but in a weird way, while this is literally him. 95% of the time just singing lyrics of a already written TV show theme song over top of mm-hmm. the music of an already established song. I still think that the stuff that I have below it, which is my Bologna and I love Rocky road 
are like fun and cute, but still very pedestrian to what I've come to expect from Al now that we're at this part of his career where like, I love Rocky Road and My Bologna. There's large chunks of it where it's like, you're essentially just singing the song and changing a word like a Mad Lib where this is like way more interesting in the way that it's been like weirdly constructed and pieced together in a way that shouldn't work, um, but but strangely does. So that's where I'm placing it. But now I am so excited for this because poor Patrick has only been here for an Al TV. We didn't we didn't do this with Al TVs. Well, that wouldn't make any second. sense. Matt, don't forget, <laughs> we also have to rank a music video. That's right. We do have to rank wow. a music video for this one. You know what? It's almost like part of me is like, oh, this is barely a music video. Uh, I actually think I'm going to plop this at the very bottom of my list, I think, for the music video. No disrespect to David Silverman, but you said it really well, Matt. It's kind of boring. <laughs> it, it is. I, and you know what's oddly? Like, especially, and maybe it's not fair to judge the music video this way, but especially in the context of UHF. Like the thing that bums me out about this watching UHF is that in the grand scheme of that movie, this is like a low light. Yeah. And it shouldn't be. That's not fair. Like, well, it, unless it's, you're yeah. Patrick McDonald who showed up for a musical and was like, where's the music? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, yeah, but in the context of the movie, it just has very little function and it's it's not as it's not as funny as any of the other musical sketches that he has right. gotten into this, this movie. It's, it's yeah. oddly just like they dropped a music video into the middle of this uh, film. Uh, so I'm going to agree. I'm going to put it at the bottom. And again, it's not, it's not bad. It's just not nearly as, uh, as like funny or entertaining to watch on its surface. The, the best thing about it is how close they got it to the original yeah. and how, I how good it looks. I could be For totally sure. wrong, but I'm pretty sure that that VHS tape that I talk about, the Weird Al music video collection, does not include this song on it. Like, I'm oh, pretty sure that that they even were just like, ah, oh, that's a scene from a movie. It's not true. And he was, like, he, Al, as we know, Al was very upset about the asterisk. Yeah, so he that's did not probably like what that asterisk. <laughs> All right, now's the part that everybody's been yeah. waiting on. Patrick, oh, we've boy. sent you the guest okay. li- rankings. First and foremost, where are you putting money for nothing slash Beverly Hillbillies asterisk? Okay, so this is this is a great list. I've I've really poured over things. I literally looked up a bunch of specific lyrics because I was like, what are some lyrics that I prefer more than other lyrics? Um, I, I want this to be very important. Uh, I I I think it's gonna hover around where lasagna is right now on tw- at twelve. Um, uh, it might go a little up. To me, it's like it's the song from his movie, so it's a little important to me. But it's not. I don't think it's like. You know, it's definitely not as good as like a surgeon, and I think like a sh- surgeon should stay there. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna put money for nothing above slime creatures. Okay. So we'll make it cool. That'll make it twelve. Okay. Perfect. perfect. Just great. wanted to clarify that real quick. Um, and all great. right, you can move any one of these anywhere you okay. want. Where Where this are you re ranking this? Okay, so I can move one up to something else, right? Or back. or one down. I can move one down. If you can say or that down. is way too high, man. Where's Girls Just Want to Have Lunch? Is it still last? Yeah, it's yes. still dead last. I think that's disrespectful. I'm going to move that up to 15. <laughs> Girls Just Want to Have Lunch moved up to 15. I love that. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> love it. Patrick, you are always such a lovely guest. You will absolutely oh be back, uh, whether you want to or not. And before we sign off, where can people go to check out your comedy, your Jimmy Buffett uh, fandom, and all of that other good oh, jazz? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I am at, uh, on Instagram at Patrick, 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 Patrick. That's four Patrick's, uh, uh, on Twitter at Patrick McDonald, zero instead of an O. And then you can find our, uh, you can find me on Friday nights on Radio Margaritaville, Sirius XM channel 24. Uh, and then our podcast licensed to chill the official Margaritaville podcast, which just launched like two months ago, uh, is wherever you get your podcast and on Sirius XM and all that stuff. Um, and then other than that, yeah, I also have an improv podcast called Artists on Artists on Artists on Artists, which is an improvised uh, roundtable. So we do like, you know, bullshit pretentious roundtables about all kinds of topics with a bunch of fun guests. So uh, that's on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast as well. Awesome. Well, Patrick, we will have you back. Maybe something I've been kicking around in my brain space is, uh, you know, you love that food album. I do. And- and eventually we're going to get to the food album. We got to figure out what to do for the food album because we're not going to we're not going to re-review a bunch of songs that we've already That's covered true. and ranked. It's a compilation. 
So I mean, that's the thing I was going to say too. I, from what I've been, you know, I study uh, musicians who go through the '90s, and you're about to hit the box set era in a massive Ooh, way. Weird Al leans into the box set era. It's such a funny era of music because people build these box sets out of nowhere. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it's really funny. Uh, but yeah, I know it's interesting. Maybe you'll have to do some sort of food episode. Where you well, so what I was thinking, let's we'll, we'll yeah. uh, we're we're good with working with our audience here. Let me spitball this to the three of you. Yes. What if? What if we did an Al food song draft where we could pull songs even that came out after the food album? Wow. And we just do a round robin draft of the three of us trying to get our favorite Al Yankovic food songs in honor of the food album. I'm game. I'm game. That sounds fun. I like that. That sounds like a challenge. That sounds okay. fun. I'm into that. Yeah. All right. Let's I think do I'm in. I think that's the plan then, guys. So Sweet, stay gorgeous. tuned. Unless you guys sound off in the Facebook group if you absolutely hate this idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to get comments. And as per usual, Tell we reserve you. the right to completely ignore you. I completely ignore you. <laughs> um, don't forget, at the end of every one of these albums, we do a mailbag episode as yes. well. Uh, a mail bag, uh, as I spell it in the <laughs> in the episode titles. Uh, but yeah, get those emails to us with your thoughts on UHF throughout the next couple episodes, and we'll most likely read all of them. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so stay tuned, and we'll be back with even more Al Yankovic goodness. <laughs> listening to the Geekscape Network.